today's session of uh, the conference of the Spring School. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Kate Sonderger, the oh, her pardon, yes, for my pronunciation of her name. And uh, Professor Sonderger is from Virginia Theological Seminary, Alexandria. And her, uh, her lecture is entitled Naturalism and the Doctrine of Creation. And she's expected to speak to us for 45 minutes about, and then uh, I will uh, uh, give room to audience for answer for questions and answers five minutes in order to conclude at uh, half past ten. Thank you. Good morning. morning. It's an honor to be here, and I'm especially pleased to spend time with you this morning thinking over these topics uh, in the presence of a longtime friend, Lynn Rudder Baker, whose work I admire enormously, and Roberta Monticelli, who is such a fine philosopher and friend. In a poem of rare mastery and power, the English poet William Blake muses about a creature enigmatically titled the tiger. Brawny and terrible, the tiger's fearful symmetry is forged in some terrible, unearthly furnace. Sinews and eyes and heart hammered out in the fire of some distant deep. Looking back on his delicate songs of innocence, Blake asks the haunting question about this fearsome tiger. Did he who make the lamb make thee? Is this maker who, Prometheus-like, seized the fire to bring to life this terrible thing, is this one the very creator of heaven and earth? Was his fiery act of manufacture a creation? And like the Lord God of Genesis, did this maker smile his work to see? Blake does not answer his own questions. Perhaps he considered the songs of experience from which Tiger is drawn to raise questions unanswerable within the life of sorrow and fear and sin, we know all too well. Blake could not answer these questions, it seems, but perhaps he could lend us his framework to explore the doctrine he adumbrates so finely, the doctrine of creation in the modern age. A child and architect of the modern, Blake sensed in his poetic imagination the elements of the modern doctrine of creation in the West. The tiger sets out a vision, dark and brooding, of a world that is at once natural and distorted, familiar and alien, a maker, at once lord of grace and a stranger, a creator, and a terrible power. Here, we see the themes that will carry us from the brink of the modern, the late enlightenment and burgeoning romanticism, to the suffering heart of the terrible century, the 20th, and the dawn of our day, the 21st. We can summarize these elements this way, the theme of the natural, of naturalism, the theme of the artifact, and the theme of Genesis, the absolute beginning of all things. The doctrine of creation most broadly and traditionally treats the absolute origin of all things from God. The prominence of our third theme, Genesis, marks out the modern era as fully traditional in the midst of many innovations. To be sure, Genesis in the 19th and 20th centuries 
could hardly speak with confident tones that were shared in the earlier eras. From the rise of modern astronomy and particle physics to the carbon dating of our Earth and the development of present-day animal species, the genesis of all things from God has found itself in the midst of pitched battles over the place and cogency of Christian doctrine in an intellectual climate dominated by the exact sciences and the fear of them. It will take all our concentration to set out this element in the modern doctrine of creation without falling prey to the old and I think discredited story of religion against science on one hand, but also the newer and hardly more persuasive story of science as the confident and supreme champion of the entire field. In sum, we will see the theologians of the modern and postmodern age strive to confess the doctrine of creation in a world that remembers Blake's natural lamb of innocence, but cannot forget the tiger that roams freely in our day, the natural lamb and the artificial tiger, each in its own way mysterious and demanding, each in its own way dependent upon the genesis of the almighty maker of heaven and earth. So I begin with the genesis of the natural world. Both the higher unity, but deep divisions too in the understanding of God's genesis of creaturely nature point to an original and rather unexpected question that will begin our entire investigation. When God created all that is, just what is it he made? Aspects of this question are not new, of course. As we will see, traditional elements will emerge throughout the discussion of this topic. But in the main, this is a modern question raised by modern science and the philosophy that accompanies it. Although this topic will return in different guise when we discuss the modern conception of nature and the natural, it belongs here as the precondition for any discussion of creation itself. The identity of that reality God created, its fundamental character, sets the terms of the debate over creation. And no exchange among modern theologians of creation can be intelligible apart from this conceptual underpinning. Just as Descartes' analysis of the nature and relation of body and mind set the terms of all modern debate about the mind and its relation to brain, whether Cartesian or no, so the fundamental analysis of the creaturely sets the terms of debate about the natural, whether Christian or no. It is the lens through which all modern Western theologians and their opponents see the world. So just what is it that God creates in the beginning of all things? Now, the instinctive response of most Christians through the centuries has been rather straightforward and filled with sturdy common sense. God makes all the things we see on our earth and all that belong to the starry heavens that stretch out beyond our earthly sight. It is just this instinct that is quietly affirmed in the straightforward or plain reading of Genesis, the book of Genesis. Greater and lesser lights, waters beyond the heavens and on the earth, swarming creatures of all sorts and winged birds, fruit-bearing trees, men and women and all animals, and light itself. All these these theologians say, are made by the Lord God, fashioned into a garden, fit for human creatures to tend and flourish within. 
as we will see, this stout affirmation of God's will to create things, animate and inanimate, will lead to complex and painful encounters with the science of this present age. Yet, it is the plainest, and to many the most compelling answer to the question before us, just what did God make when he created the world? And it is not without defenders of a very sophisticated sort in this age and in the past. To express this common sense insight in more scholastic and philosophical language, we would say, God created without any prior material or aid, that is ex nihilo, complete or whole substances. The inner and living matter, the animals and organisms, the planets and stars in their courses, the measureless galaxies that make our world a cosmos. It is this language of whole substance which will find its way into the documents of Vatican I in 1869 and its controversial definitions of nature and grace. In the first decree of Vatican Council I, the canons of the dogmatic constitution of the Catholic faith, we read the following firm affirmation of a traditional Latin doctrine of creation. If anyone does not confess that the world and all things which are contained in it, both spiritual and material, were produced according to their whole substance, out of nothing by God, let him be anathema. But the roots of this council reach much further back, back to the greatest scholastic theologian in the West, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas gives voice to the common sense tradition in his doctrine of creation, relying on Aristotle's notion of substance, itself a complex concept with its own history, when he, Thomas, asserts that God created the world in one simple, motionless act, bringing out of nothing whole substances, both matter and form. This is from the 45th question of the Prima Pars of the Summa. Now, Thomas knew perfectly well that the cosmos was filled with more than objects, living or inert. He knew that the world of things was qualified by innumerable properties or characteristics. And he recognized that certain immaterial realities, ideas, values, numbers, time itself, governed much of what we call the world. These were also created by God, Thomas firmly concludes, but they receive a special delimitation. They are concreated by God, Thomas says, as these properties or qualia accompany all that is. To advert to more modern terminology and putting J.L. Austin's phrase to rather other purposes, we could say in this common sense reading that God creates moderate-sized dry goods when he turns outward to make finite reality. Now, notice how such a concept affects the doctrine of creation in all its parts. When we encounter debates over Darwin's theory of evolution, say, or Heisenberg's theory of thermodynamics, or in another dimension, astrophysical accounts of the Big Bang, we see modern theologians of the moderate-sized dry goods school attempting to square their doctrine with these scientific accounts as they relate to visible, tangible objects the level on which it takes place. In their doctrine of creation, they are anti-reductionists. The scopus, or goal of God's creative will, that is, is directed toward objects. The debate for these theologians assumes this goal. And from this presupposition, 
turns then to questions that remain on the composition of objects and their creaturely origin and destiny. For this reason, the evolution of the species posed the greatest threat to these theologians' doctrine. Natural selection concerns and presupposes medium-sized objects in all its varying interpretations. Of lesser danger to this school are the theories of modern quantum mechanics or astrophysical origin and collapse. For these theories are seen only to touch on the parts or elements of physical reality which compose objects and not the objects themselves. A kind of instrumental cause is assigned to these theories of subatomic or cosmic physics. God may make use of these particles and their behavior to achieve his goal, the creation of medium-sized objects in a harmonious universe. Just as a carpenter may make use of a hammer or level to set out the framing of a house, so God may make use of these physical elements and laws to create all animate and inanimate things. And in both cases, the instrument drops out of sight when the finished house or cosmos is complete. Martin Heidegger makes a similar point about the metaphysical status of instruments, die Wern, in being and time, sein und Zeit, and in a different key, Ludwig Wittgenstein made an analogous point about objects embedded in practice or language games. In all cases, the telos, or goal of God's creative will, is the finite object. And the creator's sustaining and judging and governing of the cosmos will be measured by the divine decree concerning the things and not the elements of this world. Not so do others argue. For these other theologians, the scopus of God's creative will is the fundamental particle or law that will then result in the visible and finite objects. God's intention or aim, we might say, is toward the infinitesimal and the medium-sized objects which emerge from these particulars and their relations are the upworking, or more daring still, the epiphenomenon of these deep realities. As with the medium-sized dry goods school, so with this school, we might call it the reductionist school, there are both ancient and modern philosophical and scientific correlates. To find our ancient corollaries, we must reach back to the very roots of the Western philosophical tradition, to the pre-Socratic philosophers of Attic Greece. Ancient, indeed, is the human impulse to discover the deepest reality or fundament of the world. Many of the earliest philosophers, as do their modern counterparts, held that the foundation of things could be uncovered by going deeper, moving down through the layers of the known and visible world to a hidden and truer element that is the basis of all things. For such thinkers, all things are in reality, one thing or one kind of thing. Though the cosmos appears diverse, it can properly be reduced to one element, one particle or kind. Heraclitus taught that the world, in its deepest and truest sense, was fire. As there is no flame without motion, so the cosmos as a whole, at its deepest reality, is change, ceaseless motion and alteration. To be sure, many things in this cosmos appear static, 
permanent, unshakable, but it is just this appearance to the eye and common sense experience or measurement that must be set aside and seen through to its deeper identity. A parallel but inverted scheme can be seen in Parmenides, for whom being is eternal and all change and illusion. Common to reductive accounts of creation, ancient and modern, is this appeal to a conceptual reality of all things, at once deeper and higher than anything our senses and instruments can record. Democritus began a long line of analysis in Western thought when he sought the fundament of reality in atoms, those parts of whole objects that could be divided no longer. These were simples, the deepest and truest building blocks of reality. A second form of simplicity proved far more troublesome for the doctrine of the world's creation in time, however. In its way, this form of simplicity provided a ground for holding that the world is eternal. We might think of this as a second root of the reductionist impulse in the medieval conception of nature itself. Much to the dismay of modern interpreters such as Colin Gunton, the notion of the simple carried over into Christian doctrines of created or material objects in Thomas and other Augustinian theologians. All created things, these medievals said, were composed of an utterly simple, yet utterly inferior kind of stuff titled prime matter. Without form or definition, it was close to nothing, in Augustine's fateful phrase, and just so could enter into the composition of every created thing. We should be quick to note, however, that such reductionism remains an impulse only, as created objects for these thinkers are far more than their matter. Indeed, their reality lies not in matter at all, but in their definition or form. When we turn to our era, however, we see the strong resurgence of full-throated reductionism in philosophical and scientific circles and its downward pressure on the doctrine of creation. Consider that architect of English enlightenment, John Locke. In his reasonableness of Christianity, Locke affirms, though in passing, the doctrine of creation and God as almighty creator to be the bedrock of rational religion. Locke's Christianity is hardly traditional or dogmatic, despite this conventional nod toward the doctrine of creation. Famous to the reasonableness, after all, is Locke's confident assertion that nothing more is required of the Christian than to assent to the teaching that Jesus is the Messiah, is it should be, an assertion considered reductionistic already in Locke's own day. Rational religion was certainly reductionistic in just this sense, the fewer dogmas the better. Yet the reductionist commitment of modern philosophy does not properly pertain to elements of Christian creedal belief. Properly, reductionism in its full power pertains to worldly ontology, to the theory which enumerates the kinds and qualities of finite created things. For John Locke, a certain form of reductionism in creaturely substance makes our knowledge of creation and the aims of the creator deeply mysterious. Locke interpretation is notoriously vexed, so we must treat, uh, tread carefully here. But his positions, however interpreted, are so 
vital to modern conceptions of epistemology, metaphysics, and religion that we must hazard a reading all the same. In his essay, In Human Understanding, Locke draws a famous distinction between the substance, or literally the underlying reality of a thing, it is that which I know not what, on one hand, and its appearance to our eyes and thought, on the other, its hosts of primary and secondary qualities. Objects are conjuries of qualities as they strike our sense and awaken our intellect. Two sorts of uh, two sorts can be intellectually discerned. Primary qualities, which inhere in their substance, apart from our sensing them, and secondary qualities, which depend upon our encountering the object and judging it. Locke seemed to think that extension, Descartes' great property of matter, belonged to primary qualia, but added solidity and impulse as objective properties of things. Secondary qualia consist in the properties we most common sensibly associate with things, <clears throat> color and taste and texture, even utility. Already the notion of primary quality reduces objects to elements, atoms or perhaps corpuscles that fall outside human sight and touch. But the deepest reality of an object lies far deeper in the unifying concept of substance, a reality so metaphysically hidden that we can know just nothing about it. A great gulf is here fixed between our experience of the world and its deepest reality, a gulf that will in time be known as philosophical idealism, though its earliest advocates, Locke and George Berkeley, were considered to be classical empiricists. The stern transcendence and hiddenness of substance in Locke's reflections lead him to teach that God's providence fits us out to see the world after a human and creaturely fashion and graciously shields us from sensing the world as would a powerful telescope or perhaps microscope, a monstrous and debilitating power for a finite and human creature. Yet the goal of God's creative will is the substance with its primary properties the deep and true unity of all things. And it is just this that we can conceive through reflection, but never encounter or know. Such ideas live on in the philosopher of Lutheranism, Immanuel Kant. For Kant, the world of medium-sized objects could be understood and known only by retaining clearly in the mind a distinction or schema that separates the truest reality of the thing from its appearance to, its sense, to our senses. That distinction is Kant's celebrated contrast of the noumena from the phenomena in every act of knowing. Kant does not deny that we have certain and trustworthy knowledge of the world Indeed, his critical philosophy presses every lever to achieve such certainty under the conditions of modern scientific thought. Yet, Locke, like Locke, Kant's distinction between things in themselves, of which we can know strictly nothing, and things for us, forces Kant to radical positions that threaten the foundations of his very campaign. So radical is Kant's denial of the experience of, and so the knowledge of the deep underlying substratum of objects, that it is not clear whether in the 
Critique of Pure Reason, Kant affirms a particular substance underlying each object, or whether in the end he must affirm that there can be only one noumenon, an utterly uniform, simple, or prime matter that supports each object and its qualities. Puzzles of this kind led Kant to express reservations about most traditional metaphysical and theological categories, from the doctrine of the soul to the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo. Dogmatic doctrines of this sort must be relegated to the realm of moral and intellectual usefulness. These ideas regulate or limit our thoughts so that in Kant's celebrated trio, we can recognize what we can know, what we can hope, and what we can do. Kantianism, then, is reductive in a critical sense. The truest reality of the world lies underneath what we can encounter and know. We cannot know it, but can only infer and point to it. It may be in reality but one substance, and we cannot properly know, but rather believe and postulate that God as creator willed and sustains it in being. Modern scientific accounts of the physical law of finite objects do not stray so far from Kantianism, though in a strong and reductive sense. Consider the modern thermodynamic concept of the cosmos. Here, we find a reductionism so thoroughgoing that to apply it directly to the doctrine of creation would entail a symbolic or mythic reading of Genesis altogether. <coughs> that is because the objects named in the creation narratives could scarcely constitute the goal of an omniscient creator. Rather, the author of the physical laws of the universe would aim instead at the deep and universal reality of the cosmos energy. Matter, for these physicists, is a form of heat or energy. From the largest visible object to the tiniest subatomic particle, energy constitutes the building block and deepest reality. Indeed, the very notion of an object or thing is revised in such quantum physics. All physical things are composed of atoms, these scientists tell us, and these atoms, far from representing Democritus's simples, are themselves divisible into particles, each bundles of energy. Atoms, molecules, compounds, organic and inorganic elements, minerals, gases, liquids, all are forms of energy joined together by chemical bonds that are themselves forces of energy. To break down and decay, to cook and slice and boil, to eat and digest, to separate in nuclear fission, in all energy is released, and in the latter, tremendous annihilating energy, a power that has reshaped modern politics, and modern war. Parallel to such descriptions of the object as energy is the modern notion of force field, a notion associated with Michael Faraday and put to great dogmatic use by the modern Lutheran theologian Wolfhard Hunnenberg. For Faraday, the force field expressed the unique properties of magnetism a power fascinating to the early scientific naturalists. Magnets attracted iron filings in patterns around the magnet's poles. These patterns marked the outer reaches of a field where magnetic force would register and attract. Later physicists generalized Faraday's findings to the cosmos as a whole. The universe 
was an interlocking structure formed by the forces of energy in relation and repulsion to one another. The world of things is revolutionized, no longer freestanding or independent, no longer discrete substances, however counted and conceived. Creaturely objects are now nodes in a web of energy, places of density where energy has coalesced and becomes visible to the naked eye. This web of relation gives rise to objects scarcely conceivable to an earlier generation, yet it has now become the fundament of all finite reality, the energy that drives the universe in all its parts. Reductionism could hardly find a greater partisan than these theoretical physicists. The Heraclitan fire returns now under the idiom and concept of energy and its forces. One step remains. In modern philosophy of science or in metaphysics, reductionism is laid out as a complete theory of the cosmos and all things within it. For these philosophers, particularly in the Anglo-American analytic tradition, all objects, organic and inorganic, all artifacts and culture, every thought and hope and belief, all matter, living and inert, must be in fact and reality a collection of subatomic particles. For metaphysicians such as Quine or philosophers of mind such as Jaguan Kim, everything that is and every thought conceived and held must be traced back to these particles, either in element and molecule or in brains and their chemical structure and state. The biochemical account of the physical universe, sketched above, has become in these philosophers a metaphysical theory, a complete doctrine of everything. In the philosophy of mind, such philosophers are physicalists. In metaphysics, reductive or eliminative materialists. It is important and difficult to see just how radical this position is. If we were to count up all the things in this world, these philosophers say, we would count no trees, no rocks nor birds, no kitchen chairs nor dessert plates, no Sistine Chapel, no Michelangelo. That is not because such things do not matter to these philosophers, far from it. Rather, these beings and objects belong to a human, cultural, linguistic world that we might call phenomenal, following Kant, or intentional, following the physicalist Daniel Dennett. But such artifacts and conventions and practices, if they are to belong to a true and scientific account of the world, must be seen for what in truth they are, a collection of particles arranged thing-wise. Should any philosopher be a Christian, he or she would affirm that the creator God, holy omniscient, wholly immaterial and transcendent, would create this realm of quarks and positrons and electrons, and would decree the physical laws that would govern their ordering and organizing as the medium-sized objects human beings see and create prize, love, and fear. The cosmos such a god would create would be exhausted in the infinitesimal particles of energy that compose and structure and cause the universe and all its parts. With the help of these philosophers, we have reached the antipodes of our common sense readers of Genesis and their anti-reductive kin. This array from the theologians and philosophers of ordinary objects to the scientists of modern quantum mechanics, to the philosophers 
that translate their findings into metaphysics all contribute an answer to the background question, when God created the world, just what did he create? From medium-sized objects to prime matter, to quarks and positrons, the notions of the natural and naturalism have guided the modern doctrine of creation for good and ill. Now I make my own proposal. So I want to leave as much scope as I can for Christian theologians when they face the demands of naturalism. Yet I would not do justice to my own field, systematic theology, if I did not offer my own accounting of the relation of creation to the natural and naturalistic. There is every reason, I believe, for Christian theologians to defend and take seriously the world of objects, of moderate-sized dry goods. With every scientific theory in place, from cosmology to particle physics to evolution, Christians may still with confidence hold that the Bible speaks without hesitation of the creation of things, not particles or force fields or natural laws, if such there be, but of individuals and of kinds. Christians need not undertake the sorry endeavor of a harmonization of the book of Genesis with modern day astrophysics. We can quietly or gladly place that effort on the shelf marked false starts in dogmatic theology. For religion and science do not enter the world of the real through the same gateway nor do they work on the same floor, though they serve the same master and aim at the same universe of the real. Rather, Christians should rightly expect that the Bible will give them an impulse, a guiding hand, a talos, by which modern doctrine should be forged. The book of Genesis, in just this way, points theologians to the proper scopus and goal of their concern, the environment and thought world of whole, complex, and real living beings. We need not rank such creatures, though to be sure the door remains open to a hierarchy of forms of life. For my own part, I will confess that I believe human beings to stand apart and distinct from other animals and plants, but I will confess, too, that I believe Almighty God is far greater pleased with other living creatures than with us and our kind, the great predators and destroyers on God's fair earth. Far more significant, however, than the matter of ranking comes the place of diversity in Christian doctrines of creation. Once again, I believe that theologians have every reason to hear in Holy Scripture an underlying and persistent percussion of the diverse and multiple and richly complex. Christian theologians, that is, have good reason to resist the ancient pull of reductionism, of simplicity, of uniformity. The integrity of the world that we live in a cosmos, not a disordered array, rests not on the conviction that at base everything is one and of one kind. Rather, the remarkable and irresistible conviction that we live in an integrated whole, a working universe and a home, rests not on its substance, I say, but rather on its relation to another. Unity is an external and relational property, an essential one. The entire world comes from God, the Creator, and in virtue of His work and gift, it is a whole. The rich diversity of this planet, and perhaps other planets and star systems as well, 
is an exceedingly good gift that need not be thought away in a misguided search for simplicity and coherence. The metaphysical wholeness and interconnection of this earth rests on its origin and destiny. In scholastic idiom, its exit and return to God. The world is natural, that is, but not alone. Or to speak once again in the poetic diction, this time in the stately words of Gerard Manley Hopkins. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest, freshness, deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breasts and with ah, bright wings. That's from God's grandeur. So to conclude, William Blake introduced our themes for a modern doctrine of creation, of the tiger, burning bright, sinewy, and terrible, an artifact forged in an industrial age, and of the lamb, innocent and mild, born in some distant garden when nature was young. The modern doctrine of creation has encountered both animals in its complex journey through the thought forms, philosophy, and science of our world. Christians have struggled to understand the very foundation of the world, its composition and character, and have sought at times at great cost to find God's presence, design, and will in the ordering of nat nature's laws, growth, and creatures. They have witnessed over two long and often brutal centuries the God-forsakenness of a world seemingly left to its own cruel self-destruction in war and famine and despoilation. Yet Christians have remained faithful to the doctrine of creation's central tenet, that God is the absolute origin of all that is, that what God has fashioned is wonderfully made and rich in divine benevolence, and that human life, however ordered and however wayward, <coughs> receives from this natural world a grace and gift, fresh each morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie. Very beautiful lecture and also many emotions <laughs> have been provoked. Mm -hmm. So uh, please, uh, we can we can open our. Uh, yes. First of all, thank you, Kate, for this magnificent magnificent lecture. Thank which you. Is also, I think uh, a lesson in the English language. I really follow it with biggest pleasure. And now I want to make clear that it's. It, it, because of the fact that we were late uh, in beginning, uh, in order to wait for the other people coming, uh, I, I do think that we can take more than five minutes. Uh, uh, discussion. Discussion. Yeah. 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 minutes for discussion now, and then we can post. Right, right. Anyway, uh, okay. Or we can. No, yeah. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes as everyone else. We had fifteen minutes for. That's what you suggest. Yes, I suggested to have now discussion for 15 minutes yes. and then to... Yes. Uh, okay, very well, very well. Okay. So, um, well, uh, I'd like to start for my question uh, from the very end of your paper. Uh, this mention to the fresh, uh, to the, to the, to each morning, so to speak, to the press, to the, to the living present, if I may say. Yes. Now, um, um, when you quoted uh, St. Thomas, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, 
I was thinking there must be a, a, a passage where he says that the quale and the quantum of space and time are not an object of theology. Which means that, in fact, uh, um, whether uh, space-time is infinite or finite, and how it is filled with matter, this is not an object of theology. But now, uh, um, I think that this uh, idea, this, this, so to speak, uh, apparently scarce and uh, poor ambition for, for theology, uh, goes back to St. Augustine. If I, I, I do remember, I'm not quite sure, but in, in the, at the end of the Confessions, in, in the 13th book of, of the Confessions, um, or maybe in the 11th of the time, I don't remember, uh, he says, uh, well, look at people asking uh, what was God doing before creating the world? And he says, uh, well, he, his, he was preparing the hell for people asking for such a stupid question. Why? Uh, that's very clever because, in fact, he says uh, um, uh, the, uh, the world uh, is created with the time and not in time. Yeah. Now, if this is true, then why? Couldn't we just think of creation as, uh, well, uh, as Augustine say, eternity is your present day, your present morning, so to speak. So, as a kind of, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, always a new origin of the world every day, every moment, every present, which would be compatible, wouldn't be, with the idea of the ontological novelty of things all the time. I mean, the fact that we are. Okay, that was my idea, but I don't know if it's um, compatible with what you said. Yeah. Right. Maybe we can collect two, two more questions in order to respect time. Oh, I'm sorry. Everybody's supposed to separate. Ah, okay. Sorry, please. I will try. I was to be brief. I hope it goes on too long. So no, no. We have a theologian in our midst. <laughs> um, I think there are a, a couple of ways we could think about these uh, wonderful themes that you've raised, Roberta. Uh, one possibility is to look at the uh, debate in the in the prima pars of, about whether the world is eternal or not, and uh, perhaps that's the section you were. Uh, considering Roberta, uh, there I think. Um, how are we doing now on sound? I'm coming up. Yes. Okay. Um, there, I think uh, Thomas is willing to say that the uh, creatio ex nihilo is an article of faith uh, and does not have. Uh, demonstrative uh, status uh, in natural reason. So in that way, um, the absolute origin of all things from God is part of the um, body of doctrine of dogma rather than a deliverance of reason uh, and so is compatible with a, a rational idea, of um, conceptually compatible with the idea of the eternity of the world. Now that has given rise, that, that discussion between um, a natural philosophical argument about the um, sempiternity of the world and of the doctrine of creation has given rise to the idea of creatio continuo. And I think that would be compatible with your second view. And this is a view that Schleiermacher, uh, the great 19th century theologian, and in uh, closer to our day, Paul Tillich, the German-American theologian held, that creation is not an, uh, an act at the origin uh, by which uh, things are made and then there is some kind of distinction, a Sabbath, uh, where providence then begins, but in fact 
each now is created with its diversity of objects. So you, you actually could have a, it could be a kind of occasionalism. You could argue that God, each now, is making the world. And that in virtue of it being a benevolent God, this, this uh, continuous creation is stitched together and creates for us a cosmos, a world. So uh, perhaps you hold to creatio continua. Uh, thanks, just a, just a clarification. Um, but I'm not sure whether I'm forced to be an occasionalist. No, no. Uh, it, it's uh, not if, if I propose, to, uh, quite simply, um, that the priority of, say, God, the absolute, on whatever exists contingently, yeah. is not of a temporal or kind, the chest of an ontological. Yes, and in fact, um, yeah, Thomas uses this lovely example of a footprint in the sand. And I think this is um, maybe in Castillo 47, I, um, where um, others will know better than I, that um, when the foot hits the sand at the beach, you have at the same time the imprint and the foot. Um, yet, the foot is the absolute cause of the imprint. Uh, and perhaps the world is like this, so that God is making the world at every moment, yet the world is completely contingent on the infinite, perfect, and absolute causal authority of God. Right. Uh. Kathy, as Roberta, I appreciated the, also the literary uh, mm -hmm. side of your, you know, thank analytic you. philosophy. That's not very common, so it's refreshing. Uh, <laughs> and also, as to the content, I was really admired. Uh, you presented two main uh, traditions about creation. So one is, let's say, broadly Aristotelian, so it's pluralistic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. non-reductionistic, and yeah. also at the uh, middle side dry goods, but has the problem that it's not creationistic, that there is a, about the eternal world originally, so that has to oh, be reformulated. Right. And then the other one, that is, has creation, generally the Epicurean, Lucretius, uh, mm -hmm. uh, view, uh, is, but is monistic and reductionistic. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the, the Heraclitian version that is about energy, yeah. but still yeah. is a form of reductionism that mm -hmm. forgets about the the middle side dry goat. Uh, and then you present your own view. Yeah. And I was a little surprised that you didn't mention the big tradition to which I think you belong. And that's a Plato's tradition according to what Hartwell Lovejoy wrote in his masterpiece, The Great Chain of Being. Yeah. Because it's, this is exactly where you belong, and you, after, you know, Leibniz belong. This yeah. is exactly about pluralism, creationism, non-reductionism, about substances that would perhaps would be called nowadays Middle side dry right? goods. Yeah. This is the tradition to which you belong, yeah. and I would mention this in the paper. Oh, lovely. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, um, I try to be um, a bit uh, Spartan in um, what I discussed here, but I do have very strong uh, Platonizing uh, tendencies, and uh, particularly um, in the use of transcendentals and. Uh, Roberta and I had a chance to talk about John Scotus, and I, I think the way in which the Plotinian tradition has brought in the significance of the one, uh, the uh, true, the good, um, and how this descends down through the categories of being, I, I think this is very important for Christian doctrine and gives both unity, the principle of one, but also diversity. The, the categories and I um, and I myself would want to use that rather than say natural law to uh, generate the notion of a cosmos or the uh, the Kantian transcendental move. Yeah, yeah, great, great. More, more. That's what we want. Yeah. One more question, please. Page five. Page five. Yes. Yeah. Oh. On page, <coughs> on page five, um, you mentioned 
ideas, values, numbers, and time itself yeah. are concreated by God. Mm -hmm. We cannot have the other key. Yes. Uh, uh, Lynn is asking a question about this, uh, what I take to be a technical term in Thomas, of concreation. And, and there, I, I take uh, Thomas, uh, he anticipates so much in, in modern philosophy. It's, well, he is one of the great intellects, I think, of our, um, of our kind. I, there, he, he recognizes that there is a, a certain priority in God's creative will, uh, prescinding from the uh, question of the uh, time of creation, um, that God is creating um, and intending objects, the, the items that are enumerated and instanced in the opening chapters of Genesis. But there are these properties um, accidents that inhere in the subject, the substance. And those accidents, uh, Thomas affirms, must also be created and contingent on God. And this must be true even when they're abstracted from substances and something that is the, the container of the world, um, time, and location, place. So it, what God does is create a world that has implicators. It, it has um, elements that are necessary in order that these objects are not simply an array, but have order and a place and have development. And those are created with, concreated. Uh, and this, uh, yes. So, so uh, Thomas can affirm that everything is created, um, it, including numbers, say. But God is not intending uh, a, a list of things, a list of qualia, say, and creating those, and then creating uh, humankind and and plants with seeds, and then they develop other plants and so on. It, no, God is creating these living and inanimate things. And in order for them to be the world that we live in and that he wills, there is concreated, their qualia and space and time. I'm wondering about things like mathematics. Yeah, Descartes but, thought that it would be possible, I mean, that God could make it that 2 plus 3 did not equal 5. Uh, yeah, right. Do you think that, is that, a, is that the kind of creation you're talking about? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, now, in Thomas, that would not be possible because yeah, um, God's will executes God's intellect. So uh, Thomas uses, I think, a kind of faculty psychology here. So. Um, so in God's being, there is both will and intellect, and this is going to get worked out in his doctrine of Trinity. But the, uh, the will executes the intellect. So the, uh, God's intellect is perfect and perfectly good, and the uh, sums of mathematics, as well as all the complex uh, elements in the mathematical world, are known by God perfectly, and these are executed by God's will. Now, there's some talk in, in later scholastic thought when the faculties are reversed, and the intellect is uh, knowing what has been willed, and the will is primary, that perhaps it would be possible, it's conceptually possible, that God could create an irrational world. And that, in my view, lies behind Descartes' discussion about the, um, the conceptual possibility that God could create 2 plus 3 to equal 12. Can, can I add something on that? Because I think the point here is potentia ultimata, potentia absoluta. Yeah, good, good. So yes. for, uh, 
for Aquinas is potentia ordinata. So the yeah. intellect sees the laws of nature, can, the laws of logic, and mathematics cannot change them. But for late people like Gregorio the Rimini and these yeah. people, right. it's the uh, reverse, obviously. and certainly the card depends on them. So yeah. there the will can do what they what God wants and the yeah. intellect obeys. Yeah. So it's for yeah. voluntarism against uh, versus intellectualism. Right. And uh, and especially if you pick up that theme in Gabriel Beale, say, of a double covenant. So uh, there's there's this kind of covenant of uh, the ordained world, the world that we experience and the world of the church and its sacraments. But there's also a kind of um, a wild, unconstrained power, an absolute power of God. Uh, and this um, is some kind of possibility in God. It, uh, and there is scholarly debate about whether Luther was influenced by this when he talks uh, about the, the uh, naked God as opposed to the God who is clothed by grace. Uh, now such a God could create a hellish world, could create a world that is uh, finite yet completely disordered and completely irrational. And you could have a kind of occasionalism to it. So today, um, two and three is five, and tomorrow it's 12. And so that the clockwork uh, orange world could be the result of the potentia absoluta, this, this power that's unconstrained. But God's goodness uh, prevails so that God, in fact, has created an ordered world. Right, this is it. Uh, so I, I deny these two powers. I, yeah, I, th I think that's destructive to the benevolence of God. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Professor Sandler.